Um, I just wanted to say you heard a fantastic talk by John Rasco, and I want to tell you my role in that. Um, when I was a registrar, John was a resident, and let's say he was a pain in the neck as a resident, that's fair to say, and he had these huge mutton chop side levers, which were fashionable, basically, in his mind, and it, he looked like a Civil War general, and he annoyed me once too often, but I got four of my colleagues to hold him down while I shaved one of his sideburns off. And as he got up with shaving cream over his face, he said, Grunstein, I'm going to find gene therapy for haemophilia. And he did. And I want to tell you I'm responsible for that. <laughs> Thank you. OK. How many of you um, had a fantastic night's sleep last night? There's a few there, liars. Um, OK. What I'm going to talk about is that sleep really does matter, and you need to get it right away, not anyway. OK? Um, the sort of work that I'm going to present comes from uh, part of our research program. Sydney Research ha houses some of the world's leaders in, in sleep research and making major contributions in a whole lot of areas from <coughs> new drugs for sleep apnea to, uh, you know, all, all different types of research. But we're going to talk about some advances through uh, our program of NHMRC Centre of Excellence. We've had three of those, and the third one is focusing on neurosleep or, or the neurobiology of sleep. It's a concerted effort from a number of groups. We have fantastic facilities at the Wilcock Institute, but we also involve researchers at the hospital, at, at the university, who are involved um, in all our work. So you've heard about the speakers, and I'd, you can see where they come from, and they're each going to talk about different aspects of the research that we do and the program that we have. So sleep is a ubiquitous phenomenon. Every species sleeps, be it from the, the fruit fly to the sloth to the panda, and in the left bottom corner, my dog, Oscar. Um, if you don't drink, you get thirsty. If you don't eat, you get hungry. If you don't sleep, you get sleepy, and a whole range of negative health consequences we'll discuss. So sleep is complex. It's made up of two main processes. One is a homeostatic sleep drive, which you see there across the bottom, and basically it increases the longer that you've been awake. So it progressively increases during the day and obviously peaking before, before sleep. That process can be affected if you don't get enough sleep or your sleep is disrupted for any reason. That process will be accentuated so you get sleepiness during the day. Then there are drugs like caffeine and the new what are called wakefulness promoters that can attenuate that sleepiness and that sleep drive and modify it. Then we have what's called the circadian alerting signal. This is important. Last year, the Nobel Prize was actually won by the three biologists who discovered the molecular biology of the circadian alerting system. And this keeps us awake during the day. There's a bit of a dip after lunch, which we all experienced uh, today. Um, but generally, it's an alerting signal that peaks and then starts to fall. So when that alerting signal starts to fall and the, the sleep drive is increased sort of to before bedtime, that is when we feel maximally sleepy and, and, and fall asleep. The circadian alerting system can be modified by many different factors. So for example, light in the morning can strengthen that fall in the alerting signal late at night. And if you use too much light in the evening, like blue light, iPhones, etc., that can actually uh, keep the circadian alerting signal uh, up and then prevent sleep. Uh, people who get delayed uh, circadian alerting signal have a thing called delayed sleep phase syndrome. It's very common in teenagers and young adults. They can't get to sleep and they can't wake up in the morning. Then in the elderly, you have the opposite. You have advanced sleep phase. So the circadian alerting signal falls too early. They'll fall asleep at dinner time and then they'll wake up in the middle of the night and create havoc uh, in the nursing home. 
I can go back one slide somehow. But, okay. So what we have here, um, and it should be moving across, is 24-hour air traffic uh, across the world. So we live in a 24-hour society. We're on the go 24 hours a day. And what you can see here as daylight progresses across the world, there's certainly more activity during the day, but there's a lot of activity at night. Planes going, cars going, people working and so forth. And this 24-hour society means there's a lot of us who are staying awake when our body says we should be asleep. And this phenomenon is called circadian misalignment. And circadian misalignment is something that causes a great deal of health problems. It can cause mental health problems, it can cause mood disorders, it can cause errors. It's been associated with cardiometabolic problems. As I said, it can cause human error. So lack of sleep and circadian misalignment when they come together uh, can cause disasters. This is the Selby train disaster um, in 2001. One driver, one on his own, was chatting overnight to a prospective girlfriend on the internet, basically went off uh, the road driving to work, went onto train tracks, two trains coming towards each other, crashed because of his car, uh, 12 people killed, 80 injured, and his insurance company paid out 65 million pounds because of this accident. So it just gives an example of how these things and these catastrophes can happen. There's also sleep disorders. And many of you are familiar with snoring and sleep apnea. This is a patient with repeated falls in oxygen level uh, due to sleep apnea. And the main treatment for sleep apnea or for severe sleep apnea is continuous positive airway pressure. And that treatment was first applied for the treatment of sleep apnea at Prince Alfred Hospital by Colin Sullivan Associates in, in 1980. And it's a relatively new treatment in a sense. Sleep apnea, the term, was only coined for the first time the year Elvis died in uh, 1978. So you can see it's a new sort of condition. And what you can see here is the repeated falls in oxygen level being prevented by the CPAP mask. And you can see at points uh, B and C, the mask is, uh, the pressure is turned down. S the sleep apnea recurs briefly. And so not only is it a treatment for sleep apnea, but as Angela will tell you, it's something that we can use experimentally to demonstrate the effects of sleep apnea on the brain. So that's what C CPAP looked like in 1980, and it's obviously been commercialised and translated to something which is now available and used by millions and millions of people around the world. In the... Um, up, really up until the 1950s, most scientists and, and artists viewed sleep as a form of like a mini death. And so people thought the brain became totally inactive during sleep. But they're wrong. What I want to show is that the brain is in fact active during the sleep and the brain can be awake and asleep at the same time. And I'm going to show you three examples of this. Firstly, this is a man with night terrors and he's sleeping apparently comfortably in bed. But in a moment, he's going to <laughs> So he leaps out of bed. Um, he's confused. Parts of his brain are asleep, but the motor part of his brain, the part of his brain that deals with fear, they're really active. So he's got brain that's both awake and asleep. The next slide is a man with REM sleep behavior disorder. His brain is awake and asleep. It's awake enough to allow him to act out his dreams, which we normally we can't do because we're in a state of paralysis. So he's scared of something in his dream. He's having a nightmare, and he's actually acting out his dream. Okay, he's fighting something off. And Sharon will talk about why this is a Im very important disorder to consider in older Australians. Finally, I want to come back to a subject dear to my heart, my dog, Oscar. And Oscar here, he's a King Charles Cavalier, facial obstruction, snores like a trooper, he's got sleep apnea. And you can see here, Oscar is really starting to drift off to sleep. He looks asleep, is he awake, is he asleep? Not sure, he's <coughs> going off to sleep. Suddenly, 
he wakes up, or is he really awake? And so Angela's going to talk a bit about this issue about the brain, is it awake or is it asleep, and how we research that area. Thank you. Angela. Thank you, Ron. Um, could I ask on behalf of the audience that everybody have their pet as part of the presentation? <laughs> Now, it wasn't all that long ago that scientists thought that the brain switches off completely when we go to sleep, that it's inactive. But the discovery of the EEG and then the first recording of the human brain's electrical activity by Hans Berger here changed the way that we think about sleep. And this EEG technology was used in the 1950s by sleep researchers to show that, in fact, the brain is very active during sleep. These EEG traces here show how the fast frequency brainwave activity that we have during wake begins to slow as we transition to sleep. And these brainwaves slow further as we get into the deeper stages of sleep, where we see these big high amplitude slow waves, and we can see these in the red boxes here. Now, our deep sleep is the, the sleep that we get mostly at the, on the first part of the night and um, it accounts for about 20% of our sleep. Now, these slow waves are very important because they help with our learning and the consolidation of our memories when we sleep. They also are important for clearing out all of the, the waste products that accumulate in our brains from our waking activities. So, really, I like to think of slow wave sleep as restoring our brain power so that we can work at our peak the next day. So, 20 years ago, we measured sleep using a machine that recorded EEG traces on paper. And um, this would result in a big stack of paper for an eight-hour recording, and each 30-second page was reviewed and scored by a sleep technologist. But then, of course, we went digital. And today, at the Walcock Institute, we have the latest high-density EEG technology. We have these special sensor nets modeled here by researchers that are actually using this technology in their research. This allows us to record brain activity from 256 electrode sites compared to the traditional six. So it gives us a really detailed picture of the brain during sleep. But of course, we get a huge amount of data. We get some 8 billion data points from a single night of sleep. And so the way in which we analyze um, sleep is, is very different as well today. Now, we are one of a handful of sleep centers across the world that are using high-density EEG. So here in Sydney, we really are well-placed to be leading sleep research. We are linking high-density EEG to our brain MRI scans because we want to be able to identify where in the brain there's abnormal sleep and match that to brain anatomy. And we want to use this information to understand how poor sleep impairs our brain functioning. Now, thank you. Bravo. <laughs> now, high density EEG has allowed us to understand that sleep isn't a global state. And we see deeper sleep in the parts of our brain that we work hardest during the day. So the parts of the brain that we use the most, those same regions need more deeper sleep, so increased slow waves, the recovery sleep. And we call this use-dependent local sleep. So, for example, if you go on a long drive, then we will see deeper sleep in the parts of your brain that was used for that activity. And this is what we see in this cartoon here. So this shows a flattened out cortex, and we can see red hot spots of deep sleep in the brain regions that were used during a motor learning task before sleep. And that just involved participants moving a joystick around. And the more slow, we, slow waves that you had during sleep, the better your performance was when you were tested in the morning. OK, so what happens if you're sleep deprived and you don't get those recovery slow waves? So how many of you are feeling sleepy this afternoon? <laughs> quite, quite a few. Now, perhaps you didn't get enough slow wave sleep last night. Now, would you believe me if I told you you could be awake and asleep at the same time? 
Well, we, we do actually know now that if you don't get enough sleep, then some of your neurons go offline during wake in a pattern that resembles sleep. And this is what we see here in these pictures. So we, the black dots show regions of the brain where neurons are going offline during wake in response to doing a task, so either listening to an audio book or doing a driving simulator task. And when these neurons go offline during wake, we see increases in errors in performance, so the more, more mistakes you make. So let's go back to Oscar. Oscar has sleep apnea because of his flat face, and we saw that he was excessively sleepy and he was nodding off quite a lot. But way before the point that Oscar gets when he's nodding off, his neurons are going offline. And I imagine that Oscar feels like a lot of us do sometimes, that feeling that the lights are on but nobody's home. So imagine then if you have severe obstructive sleep apnea, so you're waking 30 times an hour or often more, you have very disrupted sleep and you don't get those recovery slow waves. Well, we know that if you have severe sleep apnea, you're at increased risk of having a motor vehicle accident. And alarmingly, 40% of Australian truck drivers have sleep apnea, so we know it's a real problem. But not everybody with severe sleep apnea has a problem in the day. Some people function fine, but others don't. They're falling asleep at the wheel. So here in Sydney, for the first time, we're going to use high-density EEG to investigate local sleep during wake in sleep apnea. We're going to use CPAP to turn the sleep disordered breathing on and off. And what we hope to understand is why some patients are more dangerous drivers than others. Now, we're not just using this technology in sleep apnea, we're also using it in aging. So sleep disturbance is a, a risk factor for dementia, and Sharon's going to talk more about this. We're also using it in the insomnia space, investigating work to date that's shown the intrusion of wake into the sleeping brain if you have insomnia. And that's what these pictures here show. So these white dots show increased fast frequency wake-like activity during sleep in patients with chronic insomnia. So Chris is now going to talk about how we are addressing the problems in insomnia. So I was actually a nurse at Royal Prince Alfred in intensive care many years ago and I've over a long period of time transitioned to being an insomnia researcher but I feel very much at home here and uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the uh, insomnia treatments that we've been uh, studying. Insomnia is a very common condition. Uh, we know that about 11% of the adult population have insomnia, uh, and that means that there's about 1.8 million people in Australia with insomnia. But in fact, it's broader and wider than that. We know that up to 33% of the adult population have regularly insomnia-like symptoms. And so there's a large scope for this, for treatment options. We know that it's about three times more prevalent than what Ron mentioned before and Angela about obstructive sleep apnea. And it uh, gets, as you get older, uh, you're more likely to suffer from insomnia. It's also very costly. Insomnia has a major impact on societal costs. A recent economic analysis from 2017 showed that from all causes of inadequate sleep, it cost about $66 billion per annum in Australia alone. If we look at insomnia, that accounts for about $11 billion of those costs. So for instance, one in 10 presentations to a general practitioner are for people with insomnia seeking a treatment. But by far the most common reason is a decrease in workforce productivity. And about 70% of those costs are associated with changes in workforce productivity. And this is very common in insomnia because people have impaired daytime performance. Insomnia is complex and we don't really understand the origins or the pathophysiology. But there is emerging evidence about a neurobiological basis for insomnia. 
there's evidence from several streams. We, can, we know that people with insomnia, compared to good healthy sleepers, have faster brain activity, so the opposite of those slow waves when people are sleeping. And so that may account for why people say they don't feel restored after a night's sleep when they have insomnia. The second line of evidence is that we've seen that they have reduced brain metabolites. And thirdly, there's reduced brain activation. And that reduced brain activation occurs during daytime cognitive tests, even though the insomnia act's performance may be no worse than the good sleeper. So there's definitely something going on with the brain that's explaining why people have insomnia. Overall, this leads to a state that we call hyperarousal, and this is something that occurs over the 24 hour. It's not a nighttime sleep associated problem only, it's broader than that. So how do we treat insomnia? Well, there's two main ways that are currently used. If you go and see a general practitioner, you are more than likely gonna walk out the door with a script for a prescription for a benzodiazepine or a sleep pill. Evidence uh, of that is from our group that's shown that more than 90% of patients with insomnia who present to a general practice have at least one script for a sleep medication. And a very small amount get referred on to people who can help people with insomnia. Now, here's Oscar's, Ron's dog. He's been supporting the Socceroos during the World Cup. He's absolutely ecstatic with the, with the draw last night. He was looking for a win. But unfortunately, as we've seen, insom uh, Oscar has sleep apnea, but increasingly he's showing signs of insomnia. He's staying awake at night, he's getting a big dose of light, blue light from the TV, and he's showing symptoms consistent with hyperarousal, especially when the Socceroos nearly score. So what could we do for Oscar if we didn't give him a sleep medication? We could use psychological therapies. And, and the most evidence-based psychological therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is actually two forms of therapy. The behavioral arm looks at the sleep habits and trying to realign the bed with sleep and maximizing the efficiency of sleep rather than lying awake for a long period of time. The second part is the cognitive aspect, which challenges those dysfunctional beliefs that are prevalent in the insomnia population. The problem with this therapy is that it takes a long time, it's expensive, and we just don't have enough psychologists for the people that have insomnia. So I want to talk about three solutions that we've been looking at. Two very new and one old one. The first one that I want to talk about, the new one, is the use of apps. Now, who in the audience has a mobile phone? Everyone. Who's using it right now, instead of listening to me? No. <laughs> Tweety. We believe that mobile phone technology and apps is the way, one of the ways forward with being able to do large scalability insomnia treatments. We have developed an app that looks at using a behavioral arm to realign the bed time with optimum sleep in insomniacs to try to improve sleep efficiency. It does this through actually reducing the time in bed. And that sounds crazy. Why am I going to reduce the time in bed when someone already has a sleep problem? The fundamental reason is because people with insomnia spend long time awake in bed and that exacerbates the problem. We've done a pilot study with this app and it's shown significant reductions in insomnia severity in a very short period of time and we're actually about to start a large clinical trial and we have a booth outside and if people are interested in participating in this study, we'd love to hear from you and happy for you to be able to register there. Let me tell you about an older treatment, marijuana. Now, marijuana has been used for centuries for a range of conditions, 
and we know that it affects sleep. There are chemicals in marijuana, cannabinoids, that influence a range of different brain activities, and two in particular, CBD and THC seem to be sleep promoting. But interestingly, there's not, been done, there's not been any studies that have been done in insomnia patients with marijuana. And we're going to do the world's first clinical trial looking at using a combination of CBD and THC to see if we can improve sleep in the insomnia patient. But also we're going to look at the brain activity using techniques like high density EEG to find out exactly what's going on in these patients. We haven't got recruitment started, but we somehow think we're not going to have too much trouble recruiting for that study, and we'll let you know later on about that. The last one I want to mention is a device that uses sound to improve sleep. We've partnered with Philips Healthcare, a large international company, to, to examine a device called Smart Sleep. Our two models here are modelling the prototype development and you can see on the screen the newer commercialised product. And what this device does is measure brainwave activity and when it detects one of those slow waves that Angela talked about, it uses an auditory tone at the ear to actually boost the size of that slow wave. So in other words, you're getting a better sleep quality. Now why would we be doing this is because it's relevant to large numbers of populations. So people with insomnia, people with shift work, and the older population. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Sharon, who's going to talk about the influence of ageing, sleep, and dementia. Thanks very much, Chris. So let's get started. Is everyone still awake? Yay, down the end there. I think they're all falling asleep, the lights are off. Okay, the first question is, who here is aged over 40? Show of hands, please, don't be shy. <coughs> Whoa, just what I wanted. And those of you aged over 40, keep your hand up, though you've all put them down. If you've noticed any changes to your sleep-wake patterns, the timing, the quality, not feeling restored, right, you guys, all of you need to listen. <coughs> the rest of you can go to sleep and have a little nap. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is um, really um, why we're so concerned about sleep with ageing um, and the link between sleep and dementia. Well, firstly, I need to tell you that dementia is a big problem. So we are going to have a tsunami of dementia in, in our society. You've probably all heard about it on the news. It's all very scary. A million people will have dementia by 2050, and currently we're diagnosing about 244 new cases of dementia per day. And this is essentially a problem because of the um, ageing uh, society that we live in. So there's an exponential increase in ageing and there's a prevalence of dementia of about 1% at age 60 and it doubles every five years after that. So by the time you get to 85, about 25% of us will have Alzheimer's pathology in our brain and even more of us will have other forms of pathology such as vascular pathology. But it's not all doom and gloom. So the good news is that 50% of the risk for dementia, the later onset dementias, is due to things that are modifiable. So we all know about cardiovascular disease. Well, the same applies here. What's good for your heart is good for your brain. Depression, smoking, physical inactivity, obesity, they're all problems and not good for our brain, as well as no, a low education. And we know that 50% is due to these modifiable risk factors, but there's now mounting evidence that sleep is probably the new risk factor for uh, dementia. And why I'm picking on those of us over age 40 is because research shows that we really need to be starting to think about healthy brain aging from the age of 40, from midlife roughly. There's a very long clinical period in Alzheimer's disease where the key pathological proteins, tau and beta amyloid, are building up in our brain. So beta amyloid is sticky, clumpy, and, and tau makes these tangles that are characteristic features of Alzheimer's disease. 
So this period is very, very long, and then we enter the mild cognitive impairment or MCI period. If you are in that period, you're typically presenting to a memory clinic with memory problems, and there's 50% of us will go on to get dementia if we meet criteria for mild cognitive impairment. So it's this preclinical period as well as the MCI period where we really need to be thinking about primary and secondary prevention. And MCI is important because the trajectory of MCI is often Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia or mixed Alzheimer's and vascular dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies. And sleep disturbance is a key feature of all of these dementias. These dementias account for 95% of all of the late onset dementia. So we really need to be thinking about everything we can do to prevent them. And so what is the evidence? What is the evidence where we're at linking sleep with cognitive decline and dementia? Well, firstly, if you come and see a nasty neuropsychologist like me, I'll sit down and give you some, lots of different tests of memory, and we know that performance decline on those tests is associated with sleep disturbance in healthy people, but also in the MCI stage. In our research, we've been looking at the connectivity of the brain using fMRI, and we've shown that there's a, a functional disconnection between the temporal regions of the brain and the parietal regions of the brain. And these are the regions that look after our memory, our language skills, and also our sense of navigation, our visuospatial skills. So these are the kinds of things that people with Alzheimer's would have problems with in very early stages. There's also been studies showing that there's an increase in orexin. Uh, this is the wake-promoting neuropeptide. So this is significant in people with MCI. Using PET scanning, uh, studies have shown that there's increases in the levels of beta amyloid in the brain, the key pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And these changes are related to sleep disturbance, even in the preclinical phase. Ron told you about REM sleep behavior disorder. Well, this is a big problem. If you have REM sleep behavior disorder, that you're 120 times more likely to go on and get Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. So 80% of these cases will go on to get one of these synucleinopathies. Um, and it's, so it's a significant risk factor. And this often precedes the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease by up to 20 years. And of course, we've heard about sleep disorder breathing. This is also linked with cognitive decline in dementia. So a recent meta-analysis of prospective longitudinal studies showed that those with sleep disorder breathing had a 26% greater chance of going on to get dementia. And the key mechanisms here are likely to be sleep fragmentation, so our sleep is disrupted a lot during the night, and also hypoxia due to the oxygen desaturation that Ron told you about. And as a neuropsychologist, I'm really interested in this phenomena of sleep-dependent memory. So we now know that sleep actually consolidates our memories. So if I were to tell you information now and let half of you stay awake and half of you go to sleep, those of you that go to sleep will remember that information much better than those of you that stay awake. So even in, in an afternoon nap, we will consolidate our memories better. And this is important in aging because this process of sleep-dependent memory appears to decline in aging, and it particularly declines in neurodegenerative disease. So what we are trying to do is understand why so that we can generate new treatments that target sleep in order to improve the memory of people with dementia. And we do know that REM sleep is important for procedural memories, but that really nice deep sleep is important for laying down declarative memories. What did we do today? What did we learn today? Who did we see? What was on the news? That kind of thing. So with some of these technologies, like Chris has alluded to and you saw modelled, um, we're able to actually directly manipulate sleep in order to improve sleep. The thing, however, that's really changed our understanding of sleep um, and is the impetus for a lot of the research that we'll be doing in the future is the discovery in 2013 published in Science that sleep is a sewage system for the brain or it facilitates the sewage system for the brain. So what happens while we're all awake is we're building up beta amyloid and other toxins in our brain and when we go to sleep, um, these are all drained away. And the way that this happens is that the toxins in the interstitial space between our brain 
stem cells are actually absorbed in the, into the cerebral spinal fluid, and the glial cells play a key role by shrinking and enabling the CSF to be abs absorbed back along with all of the waste. This is a really critical discovery because we now know then that the associations that we're seeing between sleep and cognitive decline and dementia are not just cross-sectional, not just, it's not just a chicken and egg kind of question. We do actually have more direct evidence now that sleep is likely to pay, play a causal role in the development of dementia. And the key thing for us that we'll really be focusing on then is what can we actually do to speed up the flushing out of these toxins from our brain. Some human studies have actually shown that we can induce changes in the cerebrospinal fluid levels of beta amyloid and the other protein, tau, by directly manipulating slow wave sleep. And so with that kind of knowledge, we can also think about doing things in reverse. If we can enhance slow wave sleep, we can enhance the glymphatic system and also improve the uh, drainage of all of these toxins as we're sleeping. So, the key message is sleep matters, not only for our health, but also for our brain. But I guess the real question here for the star of our show, dear Oscar, is what about poor Oscar? <laughs> well, I'll leave it to Ron <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> I was just checking they finished. It's a tribute to them. Some of us have been learning intellectually since 8.30 this morning. Am I right? And yet I was totally gripped and stimulated by these people, not just because I have a cavoodle, half Oscar, half <laughs> poodle, who snores at night, but because of the information being utterly critical and interesting. Would you please give these sleep people a big round of applause? <laughs> 